welcome. Thank you. Um, the group that we are um, at the 530 group, those who have signed up, we have about 20 or so individuals. Um, clearly, all of them are not here yet, but because you are here, we are not going to delay you. We um, said that the session starts at 530, and we want to go ahead and get you moved and start the tour on time so that we can finish in a timely manner, and then, of course, we'll have the next group at 630. Uh, what you will see today, and I thank you again for your interest in what's going on here at the Government Center and the condition of this building. Um, you will be touring with our um, Inspections and Codes Director, uh, John Hudgeson, and then of course you have our Facilities Maintenance uh, Manager, Johnny Hart, and uh, in his assistance. And so they will be the ones to tour you around along with the uh, Sheriff's Office. They're going to show you their portion of that in terms of security and all of that. You will see the basement today. You will see the parking garage and you, they're going to show you some piping, uh, some of that that you have been he hearing about in the news, the corroding pipes and all of that. And what you see out in the garage is typical of what's going to be in the building. And so we just didn't want to take the towel off of each of the offices. It's better to show you in the garage because it's already exposed. So you will see that, and then of course you will go to um, a couple of departments that have uh, real issues with, um, with crowding and inefficiencies because of the crowding and things such as that. And so you will see that in two of the offices of elected officials, uh, and then you will go to the fourth floor, uh, sixth floor, and look at some uh, how we are able to get to, or lack thereof, of some piping in this building, the way this building is designed. And then the last thing you will see is on the fourth floor, which will be um, the security concerns uh, from the sheriff's office, and that will end the tour, okay? Uh, you will be able to ask, answer questions along the way as you see things, think of things, or, or any of that. Please feel free to answer any questions. And so with that, John or uh, Johnny, anything you want to say? Uh, no. Uh, we'll, like I said, we'll just start from here. We'll go, we'll take the stairs to the basement. Um, we'll look at things in the parking garage and we'll get on the elevator so you can kind of get all different aspects and different viewpoints and also down the stairs. And we can talk. If you have questions, just let me know as we're walking um, and we'll try to keep you informed as best possible. Okay. All right. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I just want to add because safety and security is what falls into us. And when we're taking these stairs, um, just be careful on the stairs, and I know that's something that we I want to stress because I've had deputies that are sure-footed fall down the stairs because they're narrow. Mm -hmm. So it's more of a safety concern I'm letting you know about. Be safe on these stairs because they are narrow and there is a tendency to, to slip down them if you travel, if you're not paying attention and you're used to walking on other stairs. So just safety concern, please be careful on these stairs. Okay. Also, we want to thank our city manager, Isaiah Heatley, for being here. Isaiah, is there a word? Yeah. Hello. Thanks for coming. Okay. All right. All right. Well, with that. And, and, and I, I will yes. say that uh, John Hudson. Yes, sir. Uh, is a certified building official. Uh, explain to them what that means and, um, in regards to their, their all over the country. Correct. Um, that's the certification through the International Code Council, who is the um, leading um, building industry um, inspection services for the country. So um, having that certification, like I said, when we start to look at these things, some of them kind of jump out at you because you're like, buildings these days, a lot of these standards you wouldn't think of. And like I said, we'll mention to you, some of them you will notice as well, and the others you'll be like, I didn't think about it that way. So we'll be able to point those things out also as we're walking. You know, this building has been 47, 48 years old. So some of it is, you know, just that that's the way it is. But current building standards, there's a lot of deficiencies that, you know, it's not just space requirements. It'd be just things that would f affect the, the, the flow of the building, space, all kinds of things. I, I just wanted you to know that that's the, the highest license that one can get. Is that right? Yes, sir. Uh, in the country, and he's an architect, mm -hmm. so he knows his stuff. And yes. I just want you to know he he may he is a millennia, <laughs> uh, but he's certified, he's qualified, and uh, we're lucky to have him. Mm -hmm. So I want you to know that. Okay. 
All right, well with that, we'll go ahead and get started and what, what's not on the list, John, is restrooms. Let's just- We can, we like, it just depends on what floor we're on. We can, if we've got time or we're stopping between, one, yeah, we'll, we'll be able to show that. Okay. The only two floors that have sprinkler protection is currently this ground floor and the basement. That's it. The other 10 floors and, and the parking garage. That is it. Everything else does not have any type of sprinkler. We have our fire extinguishers on that side and that side and for your <laughs> to put out a fire, that's, that's going to be the, be the way to get to them. The building was never designed for sprinklers on upper floors? Well, like okay, I said, it's not working. From what we were told is that it was a, a cost issue at that point when they were doing the last final approval to get all the sprinkler systems done and it was one of the things that was not hmm. thought through. Um, any of any... But to answer your question, there's never been a sprinkler system on any of the floors and so I want to make correct. sure they understand. That's correct. That you see, you'll not. see something that kind of looks like sprinklers, but they're called heat sensors. Mm -hmm. So therefore, if they go off, they would signal an alarm system, which is a whole other ball of wax that is not operable. But it would, there's no, that's what the, they look like sprinklers, but they're not. So um, like I said, when this, uh, the front lobby area was done, I believe 2007, 2008, that's when some of the ADA things were added with the elevator lift and the entrances here into the jury area. So there was some ADA issues and we'll deal with those as we walk to show you kind of limitations we have American on that. Disability. That's correct. All right. All right. Do we have everybody? Anybody? Okay. I know, I'm, I'm gonna try to be loud, yeah, just knowing what we're dealing with. All right, I don't know if you've ever noticed that uh, trailer that's sitting out here. That is our current backup generator. The old one is right here. Uh, the system has just served its life. Um, right now we have a transfer switch here, and you see these giant cords that run here. Like I said, with Lieutenant Hicks, with that being kind of outside of our building envelope, that is a security concern. So if we ever had a power outage, and if somebody wanted to, something could happen to the building, they could pull our backup generator, and we've actually had that issue. When we tried to flip it over to test it, we found out that there was wires out there loose. So that is a main concern that we deal with here. Um, also while we're here, the sprinkler system here, that is the, the system there. Now, technically by code now, we would need to have a backflow preventer on that fire system, which we currently do not have. So that would be an, a, a concern as well. And obviously this is only for those two floors. So obviously you can imagine the size of piping that we would need if it was to do all 12 floors and the wings. And you currently see that we're underground. Also, you can see the concrete construction here. So even logistically trying to get this generator out of here, just you see that door, that's the only way out of here, correct? There's a, I think there's another side door, but this is it. So therefore, any of this bigger machinery, when it breaks down, they have to repair it in place. There's no way to take it out, get it on a truck, get it shipped somewhere. Yes, sir. What's the cost to the city of leasing that coming what is that, John? Yeah, we actually had to buy it because as we started to look at this and research it, we found out we couldn't move it. And so we ended up just working with that company and agreeing to a fee. I'm not 100% sure of that number, but we purchased it and it is ours now. But it was getting costly where we had to choose <laughs> which one to do. So in the design of the building, putting the generator in the basement, was that a mistake that you can't remove? That is correct. We had two issues. We have half of our mechanical systems are here and the boiler system is up on the penthouse. So imagine the, with, the, with the boiler issues that we've been dealing with, you can't physically get up to the 12th story. The elevator doesn't go all the way up there. So once again, the logistic area of trying to get that large equipment down an elevator is just not going to work. So literally the only way they would have to get it in is the way they brought it in is by crane or by helicopter or whatever. I mean, something very, very expensive. So, like I said, it's unfortunately, the, the, the greatness of having a concrete structure is that you don't have to worry about the concrete, but you also put yourself in a box and therefore you physically can't get things out of it now that you put in it. So All right. there's, there's no way of constructing any kind of a ramp with doors big enough to handle any of this stuff? I'll show you what we did that did not help us in that regard. There used to be, was it this side that had the, where the chillers are down here? 
they were built on top of the access doors <laughs> to get it out of here. Once again, like I said, so. Now, the access you're speaking of mm -hmm. belongs to Georgia Power. Correct. Right. Uh, so. That wall is a room that belongs to Georgia Power. We're all the transformers and all of that. That's correct. So the only access from here up is through a three foot door, through a round transformers, and then you have to go up through a hole in the floor, a hole in the ground. So. so Question simple terms, no ma'am. There's no way because that's below the dirt. That's right. There's no way to cut a hole. When we were replacing this, we looked at all of those options. And there's just no way to cut a hole big enough to move it because there's there's too much electricity coming in down there to take a chance on moving it through there. And this is too far underground to dig it out to try to get any way to get any of this out. So he's right. Any of this that goes out, we repair it in place. Go ahead. Can I ask everybody in here, everybody, you know, we've opened up the government center to this, and of course, mine is safety and security, but we have discussed a weak point on the security side of it, as in not being able to, our, our backup generators, if they're messed with and we lose, that's something I don't necessarily want all of the public to be broadcast about, saying, hey, that's how we take down the government center. So I ask that that part not really be broadcast on the media or, you know, because if we give the bad guys, if we give the terrorists a way to take us out, then we've got to just we show them our hands and I don't want to show up Monday and have this whole place. <laughs> to the parking garage now to look at some of the uh, pipe issues. Even the hole through the floor, which, yeah, you can see how it was seen amounted at, at first, and now it is rebar and all that is giving way. And if you would have been out here yesterday when the rain was running, I mean, it was a pool right here because all that water is just infiltrating through the parking garage. Well, that used to be a part of the old uh, parking garage system that was in place. It used to have arms and things like that. Um, and it was ceiling mounted, but through corrosion or whatever issue, it's, uh, it's come loose. And what happened is, is like literally yesterday, there was water pouring out of that hole because I guess it, the corrosion of water has made its way through and it was leaking yesterday and there was water all out here. Yes, sir. What, if any, air handling system do you have in the parking garage? We have six fans on each level, except for the executive level. <coughs> That's what you hear back over here in the car. <laughs> uh, a couple months back, I had sent the letter letting council know about the concerns we had about the hot water. This is the hot water heating system, so it's a boiler system. It's just the hot water that provides heat to the building. The concern was, is when it's up under here, it's under this insulation, we don't know the condition of the pipes. And so, uh, what wing was it, Johnny? It was the uh, it was the east wing. We had that pipe failure where it just totally corroded and, and burst. And so we had hot water, everything kind of shooting out. And if you've noticed, between here and wherever we are, there are no cutoff valves. So therefore, if it does, say if it breaks here, we're almost having to run all the way back into the building to find any type of cutoff to isolate the issue. There would just be hot water spewing out. So. We have about, we have uh, somewhere between 200 and 300 boxes like this all over the building. So therefore, that was the concern, is that at any place, either coming in or going back out, you can see this condensation. If it's happening up under that insulation, it's just sitting there and rusting that pipe out all the time. So that was the concern there. So we wanted to show you this one. This is probably one of the worst we've got. The rest of them aren't as bad. We've done investigations to kind of isolate the worst of the worst. Um, we scheduled to have a mechanical uh, contractor come in start next month to start working on this. And luckily we're doing it now where it's the summertime, so we've cut the water down, so we're not worried about scalding anybody. 
and, and that's a good part of it and so they can hopefully get it fixed before we have to go back and use it in the winter time so and we can head back once again that's the corrosion when we get to the points that we need to do cutoffs and things like that that's the level of corrosion we're dealing with all over the building the other problem is those valves are 47, 48 years old. So they're breaking off. They may or may not operate, or they may just break off. They had to break off in the back. Um, just kind of the condensed space and what they're having to deal with. Okay. Yeah, we just we just want them to stick their head in. We're not gonna, you know. Okay. Y'all tell us where we can't go, and we'll. <laughs> okay, all of this is all of these are records. All of these. So this is all Superior Court. Is everybody in it? No. Okay. What's what's in this room? This this all of this is like criminal. Correct. And all of this in these boxes. This is all something. That's correct. Um. More records. And we have them in each one of each one of these all the way down to the end. Correct. Okay. And this is just the records room and the D room. That's correct. It's on the other end. The other. Yes, ma'am. Um, also, we'd like to point out that you'll start to see some more of these, which is portable cooling units mm -hmm. to maintain the temperatures in the building, because um, any of our air conditioning systems are coming off those windows and any of um like i said depending on if you're on the south side of the building all day you're burning up then you're on the other side of the building you're freezing so <laughs> there's no and with the whole system being one system they're not split into zones or anything like that they just have to set a temperature and you just kind of have to <laughs> live with the situation so you will start to see more and more of these as we go into people's offices because either they're too hot or too cold and having another way to be able to regulate the spaces is just not set up yes sir do you know roughly what your annual electricity bill is for this building be yeah maintenance uh, somewhere around seven hundred fifty thousand dollars and how much do you think you could reduce that with a building of equal square footage but that had modern building systems? I'd say we could probably anywhere from 25 to 35%. And probably could be more than that because the way the system is, is you have a cooling system and we have a heating system. Mm -hmm. So therefore, if we had central heating and air like most people's houses and things like that are now, you could go off and on and also with zones so you don't have just one side blowing cold air all day and one side trying to get heat and then you having to operate cutting one down and cutting one up and so that it, so it could, could probably as much as a quarter of a million dollars a year just in electric bills correct with the water building correct because you have these running and then like i said even offset cost of those making sure these aren't overloading the electrical systems we got because we're just plugging them in and you go to most people's office and you look under their desk there's a Electric heat. Correct. So the how, how, how does OSHA get involved in, you know, a, a working condition where you're either freezing or burning up? Well, OSHA, I, I wouldn't speak on necessarily occupational hazards, but I don't know if they, the temperature regulations, like I said, code-wise, as long as it's above 68 degrees, <laughs> you're okay. Yeah. okay. So there's, um, on the code side, property maintenance issues that we would have, um, we would deal with any other mm -hmm. private or public. So um, that I worked would, in a building like this once, and I did, but it was before OSHA was. I understand. Um, now, where is this vented? Um, where does yeah, that vent go it, to? It just, the building, is, the building's return is above the ceiling. Okay. Everything gets pulled back above the ceiling. It goes in by these black stripes. Correct, the stripes lights. that are around the lights. It actually pulls the return in that way. So that's just vented above the ceiling and it falls into the building return. Now, is that does that handle moisture as well or is that just uh, an air duct? No, that that machine there, no, it's just it's a portable air conditioner. Right. It may or may not put off. Some of them put off a little humidity water, but most but of them don't. The yeah, not up the exhaust. Yeah, you have the drip pans are typically, and then they have yeah. to come in and replace those, and you know, kind of make sure those don't fill up because it'll system will auto shut itself off. So, all right. Um, I guess if y'all want to see the deed room, we can we can go look. One quick yes, sir. Yes, sir. So the code for sprinklers came in like. 
late seventies, I believe. Yes, sir. Recall last month the hotel fire in Hawaii. They had no sprinklers for the building. It was built like 1970. That's correct. And this building was built in 72. That's so correct. The second floor up, there's no sprinklers all the way to the top. No, sir. We'll go. I'll show you all the floors. We'll go, when we go to the fourth, we'll go to the sixth. All the floors. You'll look at the ceilings. You might, like I said, you might see something that looks like a sprinkler, but it's just a heat sensor. It's not a sprinkler. And if you've also walked through, you see there's no enunciators, the flashers, or the exit and signs to tell you which one. code to have a spirit sprinkler? Uh, I'm not sure exactly the time that it would have been, but any time after the 70s, I know when any multi-high-rise buildings, when those were coming in in New York and bigger cities, they were making requirements for multi-high-rise to have sprinkler systems. So we know we're out of compliance. I'm not quite sure how many years we've been out of compliance, but to know that we have this big a building and we only have two floors that are sprinkled is is out of code. Yes, sir. John, I know I was, I was there at the first meeting, and you got you said something there, and I, I'd like for you to kind of allude to it that um, you said something about any modification made. It's tough for you to do because now you have to bring it up to certain codes. At Correct. Time. So I couldn't just say, hey, let me make the record room up the code and then everyone else is still out of code. So the compliance issue is if you start to, it's a 50% rule. So anytime I would get over 50% over the cost of construction, I would have to bring the whole building into code compliance. So we can't just choose this little area and get it all code compliant and then ignore the whole rest of the building. So. That's why it's kind of, where do you start? We've looked, the cost that we have right now is somewhere between 750,000 and a million, and that's just for the alarm system. That's not the sprinkler system, backflow preventers, any of that. It's just for the alarm system. So if there is a fire here, that everyone in the rest of the building knows there's a fire here. We, we just don't have that capability right now. One of the things I'd like to point out, I don't know if you did, but keep in mind these are very vital records and how they protect them just in case we do have a busted pipe or something if you look over here you have this blue tarp and then they go how many of y'all been to a baseball field where yeah. it starts raining and they start running out well that's what this this group up here does is they start pulling the tarps out to tarp everything and we put the tarps up here that's just in case you know something burst or, or whatever because the all of these records um, you know, you've got adoptions in here, you've got records. Mm -hmm. And do you have those records boxes up on anything, or are they just sitting on the floor? They're, they're, they're sitting, sitting on. on the floor. We have so no even if you put the top, the tarp over the boxes... We have more than one tarp. I know, but if they're just sitting on the floor and enough water leaks onto the floor, you end up with a bottom layer well, of wet boxes. Well, if you notice those boxes, the boxes at the bottom mm -hmm. right here, those are empty boxes. Oh, okay. Those are empty boxes. So you do have them up on something? Yes. You have them up on, on another box. On another box. Question. Those records, are they like backed up on like a microfiche or on a database or something like that? Where I know I know it's a lot of records, and uh, it's the, still majo back. the majority of them. Uh, I think about two or three years ago they had a crash, uh, and and we have we're almost up to date as far as getting them all you know back in the mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. um, but the majority of them, I say eighty percent of them, they do have a backup. Okay, so. If there were a problem, you do have access to most of the files. To the majority. To the majority. Okay. All right. Um, we can go to the deed side. Be all the way down yes, ma'am. <coughs> By any current standards, these are not ADA compliant. You don't have your turn radiuses. You don't have your grab bars. You don't have your um, you. handicap accessible restroom. You don't have it. It's not. And you know, everybody's like, "Well, just make the just make the restroom bigger." But you have offices that are all around them that would make that a little bit. Um, well, not a little bit, a lot harder. You don't have your five foot clear turn radius here. So if somebody with a wheelchair were to come in here, they're stuck right here. They can't use these bathrooms. The ones that we did install on the first floor are um, handicap accessible, but if you're on any of the other floors, you do not have access. You, like I said, you get right here in a wheelchair, you could not get anywhere. The normal things you would require for a uh, ADA bathroom. Is that all the bathrooms or just the bathrooms? All the bathrooms. Wow. All of them. The only ones that are what we're dealing, you know. where our researchers come. Correct. And looking up deeds and plats and all that stuff. All that information is here. Um, like I said, I do know that we are working on digitizing a lot of this, so it is available. Are, yes. So that's in the works. But 
you just give us an example of uh, what is in this room? Just say, you know, if you're looking to access to deeds, you know, if you're looking for, you know, plats, you go to their last name and then you refer over there and you pull the record out of there and it'll have the actual plat from when it was when it was deeded or when the survey did the work. So wow. this is all property information? Yes, ma'am. So it's all in here if you search for, you know. And we do have tarps for all of this oh, as well. Just in case. Mm -hmm. And once again, another portable unit down there. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're all over the place. All right, we'll go up to the sixth floor. I, I wouldn't know. I worked in engineer prior, so like I said, I was dealing kind of more out in the field and doing other projects, so I couldn't really speak to that. Um, we're going to check and see if Judge D'Antonio's here. I was just trying to get y'all all on the elevator um, to look that way. Is he ready? Okay, we'll go with him. He's going to take over this part because he's going to talk about probate court and then we'll kind of talk about, yeah, and we'll talk about our security issues when we come back around the other way. Okay. Yes, yeah, yeah, in a half and then you have the penthouses at 12. So this whole thing went up, how much of the rest of Uptown Columbus would burn? Not, not to be a fear monger, I'm just saying. I mean, you, you've indicated that you have no means of contr effectively controlling a fire. You need to, if you're below, the, above the fourth floor, mm -hmm. you need to get out, and actually our policy is a fire, any indication of fire, we are getting out of this building as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. That's, I actually re remind our staff about that, and that is part of our policy. Do you have uh, regular <laughs> fire drills? Uh, we do, yeah, we've seen them, they do we evacuation drills. drills. Uh, but, well, let me also tell you all a little bit about uh, what where you are and who I am. Uh, my name is Mark D'Antonio and I'm the probate judge. Welcome to the probate court. I appreciate y'all coming after hours. Um, how many of you have ever been to the probate court before? How many of you... <laughs> well, let me ask this Mayor's a different way. How many of you got married in the state of Georgia? Well, if you got married in the state of Georgia, you've been to the probate court before. Because the probate courts, and maybe it was a different county, but the probate courts issue marriage licenses and weapons carry permits. Right here, you're sitting where both marriage life, yeah, and it's uh, people have applied for both at the same time. Uh, and, it, and I will let you know that it's harder to get a carry permit than a marriage license. I don't really think about whether or not that's the way society should be, but that is, uh, anyway, um, this is where gun permits and marriage licenses are issued. We have two folks that work full time doing this. We issue north of 35. 500 carry permits a year and um, over 2,000 uh, marriage licenses a year. We have a, a pretty substantial, unlike other probate courts in around, we do a lot of weddings for folks and issue a lot of marriage licenses for folks that live in Phoenix City or Russell County or Lee County, Alabama, because after the same sex marriage um, ruling by the Supreme Court, the a number of those courts have stopped performing weddings. Columbus is a military town, and I think it's very important that we let service members uh, be availed of the opportunity to get married after the Army has ruined their plans. <laughs> so we're going to continue to do weddings, and that makes us extremely busy. On Fridays, you'll sometimes see people lined up way out the door there and well beyond our capacity. You want to keep moving? All right, we'll follow you. Okay, well, um, well come on back here. Just kind of explain what all this is. They were curious yeah, about what records that. are. In addition to guns and marriages, I'll wait for y'all to come back around. Well, can y'all let me know if you can't hear me or anything like that? I can be... I can talk fairly authoritatively. <laughs> uh, in addition to guns and marriages, what I thought of probate court was dead people's property. Um, deceased people's property is a very important part of the probate court. <laughs> And uh, as part of that, it's very important to me and my staff that we get it right. Uh, with We make sure that the will is properly executed and those things. And why that's also important to the public is real property passes through wills. So those books right there, uh, and you, might, you can pull one down even, 
Um, those books are recordings of every will probate that we've done. I don't let the, I'm going to show you where we keep the live wills, but I don't let the general public, I mean, without asking permission, have access to the actual original documents. <laughs> but it's very important for, if you want to purchase a house that was once owned by somebody that's deceased, you, the title company that's going to guarantee that the house can be yours is going to have to do a title search. Right now, we sometimes have two or three folks uh, doing title searches at the same time, and they are all crammed around this table. <laughs> uh, there's a computer access for some of it, and uh, I try to make accommodate people as best we can, but, uh, and no fights have broken out among the title search <laughs> really folks, but, but I can understand why it can be frustrating when we have such limited space, and uh, that's all been since some time in, uh, well, we, we crank through about a, a one of these bookshelves a year. So we are running out of space there, too. Welcome. Now we'll be moving on into the vault. <laughs> yeah, I can cram folks in here. These are the originals. These are the originals of a number of things. In fact, actually, this is a very interesting document. Confederate trip. soldiers, yes. Um, okay, I'm really some more I, don't know if ever, I think there's probably some more people coming through. <laughs> Oops. Um, I'm just letting you y'all feel free to cram in wherever you want. You can cram in over here too. Uh, actually, there's some space over there. Can y'all see? No. There's room over here. More people can get in. Yeah, and you can probably squeeze back there some too if you want. Okay, this is where we do keep the, many of the original documents. Um, uh, the this is actually where original marriage licenses uh, are that have become marriage certificates after they're signed. Uh, one thing that's interesting about Columbus as opposed to most other southern probate courts that I've ever been to, most of them up until well into the 50s or 60s would separate marriage licenses from whites and coloreds. And that's literally, if you walk into a probate court, even in Harris County, that's how they did it. Columbus never did that. So all of our records are actually combined. Um, the probate court was once called the Court of the Ordinary, and initially the probate court had most of the responsibilities of the county commissions, the welfare department, and the Veterans Administration. And that's why we have these documents here that I uh, am t working with folks on preserving, because the probate court was where you got your Confederate War veteran pension. Mm -hmm. And pensions were issued up until the, um, well, actually up until the 1960s. So there were a number of veterans that would marry young brides so they could receive pensions. On the other side, what, this. One uh, question, please. These wonderful old books up here. I mean, they look very old. Can you tell us about those? Those are the journal back then, and it's amazing handwriting. If you open up, well, I'm not even going to just open up this because this is. Look how beautiful folks' handwriting was back then. This was before, like the books I showed you out there, oh, before you could, and actually if you deserted, you ended up in red ink. <laughs> uh, sure. Actually, Miss uh, Pemberton and a number of other famous folks are in this document. Um, tape is bad for documents. I've been talking with the Columbus uh, State University's archive folks about ways of uh, ways of preserving these. I can't give them to any of them because then they'll send them up to the state of Georgia and I don't want that, I don't want to lose that kind of control of, of things that have Columbus history involved. But we're working on at least Columbus State's going to make a disc of it so that people can review it without damaging the documents. But in this room perhaps even more significantly than this is is these are all of well these are the wills of folks that uh, of folks that have passed away these are the original wills then and joy and will just the other thing we have to store for six years and I'm happy to shred after six years are the gun permits all of this and all of those are weapons carry licenses and people's criminal background checks. Um, so we're, 
As you can see, we're literally running out of space for this as well. And uh, again, folks feel strongly about the carry permits. There's been an upturn in them, and I have to keep them for a long time. The original wills, I will never let those go to out of off-site storage or anything like that. One, because they have such historic significance. And there are people that if your great-grandfather's will is in here, you're gonna wanna see the original. And I don't, quite frankly, trust anyone, and moreover, the statute for probate judges makes me personally responsible for all of them, and I take that very, very seriously. Uh, we have the Woodruff wills buried in the deep back there and a number of other historic wills that are, it's very important. Those are the documents that will not leave anywhere I am if I can do anything about it. I'm always up for looking for technological improvements to um, do things better. There's reasons why you can't scan gun permits because of security and privacy issues related to that. Uh, so it's a, it's a, this is a challenge <laughs> to put in mildly. And you haven't seen my office yet. <laughs> Just this whole vault is bricked in. This whole vault is bricked in. This is, in theory, the safest room for, uh, for, for in case of a fire or whatever. This is also our room if in case of an active shooter <laughs> or in case of, in case of, which can, they, and we do actually take the safety stuff, uh, trains with cyanide sometimes pass down 9th Street right there. Oh, so perfect. we do have, excuse me, Joy, I'm sorry for, <laughs> we do have a bucket with duct tape to tape, to seal this even better, and the bucket could be used for other purposes too if we were in here a, a long period of time, along with water and... Uh, but, but also, you're talking about these very wonderful rare documents going back to the Woodruff Wills. Right, and going back... And even though this is double thickness brick, it's, the temperature isn't the optimum temperature right. that you would want to conserve those wonderful That's pieces. exactly right. Um, now, paper conservation is very important, and it's sometimes a little dicey. That's your, uh, you're preaching to the converted. I do, on, on more modern wills, and I might look into scanning everything so that I don't ever have to let folks, so I can keep it dark in here. Yes. Uh, right. but, but as I said, that is a, a concern. This is, these are some of the needs that the probate court clearly has, and space you can see is part of that too. Absolutely. And just um, on functionality, you also notice that because how thick these walls are, we have to bring everything from the ceiling. You see the, the running for the phone there because of it was a vault. Um, you also see that's one of those heat sensors I was mentioning about. It's not a sprinkler. Uh -huh. It's just a heat sensor. Right. So therefore if it goes off it's supposed to alarm somewhere else but, well, that, but that, uh, although in reality this is the one you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to That's sprinkler. correct. So finance is the same way. They don't want a sprinkler in their vault either. Right. So, but, on, but everything else I, I that's that's that's, you know. There are other and methods for suppressing fire. That's correct. Yeah. So, mm. you are. this is the sealed record room slash bank slash break room. Uh, so we use this both as this is the break room where lunch and all those kind of things, and it's also the sealed record room. Something I didn't mention and is actually maybe even more important than making sure deceased people's property does pass to who it's intended is looking out for vulnerable people. The probate court is responsible for minor children, which you'll see it says open minor guardianships, uh, including settlements of lawsuits related to children. We're also responsible for adult guardianships. Those are folks that have had traumatic brain injuries or developed dementia or other things like that. Again, these are not public records. Uh, our closed adult guardianships are right here. And the probate court, and what I do probably more than any other probate judge in the state, is involuntary psychiatric commitments. Because West Central Georgia Regional Hospital is here, the Bradley Center is here, we have two outpatient providers, New Horizons and American Work, uh, they are here almost every Wednesday. Right over here are the records of the involuntary psychiatric commitments going back to at least 1908, but probably a little bit earlier than that. Uh, the really early records prior to a lot of due process and civil rights that were afforded in the 1950s are quite frankly very scary. They could convene a jury to send you off to Milledgeville forever. 
and you might not even get notice of it. Uh, there is more due process to it now, but it is, um, these are again very important records and not really for anyone's public consumption whatsoever. The thing I like to note is up until 1964 in Georgia, you were a lunatic. And if you look at the book there, they were lunacy records up until then. And I actually do think there is something to lunar uh, tidal effects and uh, folks having psychotic breaks because we do seem sometimes to have an upturn on people I have to send to the hospital for an observation and evaluation around the whole. But, um, so, like I said, we are crammed in here too. But, um, All right, who can reel them in? Because we need to get going, because it's already 615, 620. My office is the only office where we share office. The reason that this person is responsible for all those guardianships and conservatorships and scattered around here are returns of living people's money and things like that. So this is the one area where I just didn't want the public in. So as a perk for the fiduciary compliance officer slash law clerk, they get the hottest office in there. But it has to be conference room slash um, photocopy room slash library. And, um, and since this is where the public is, it made more sense to allow the public to have access to the biggest office, even though I'm cramming two people in there. Now you get to see my chambers. Well, this side of this office, you won't get everyone in, I guess. This is, this is probably one of the things I do want to emphasize. You're welcome to have a seat, or is everyone, is anyone else coming in? Maybe here. Yeah, well, well, this is my chambers. Uh, actually, this half of the office is my chambers. Um, I just recently decided I'm going to keep that door closed so I could actually try to dictate to this computer here. And that's my office. I even have the Judge D'Antonio thing to prove this is my, uh, my chambers. The, where this desk here is the chief clerk. Uh, so Brooke Ballstad, my chief clerk, and I share an office. We did decide that we're the folks that are supposed to have the least direct contact with the public, so it sort of made sense for us to cram uh, ourselves into the smallest office. When Brooke, as you can tell, Brooke had a baby. <laughs> uh, when Brooke was out on maternity leave, this office looked, there were papers everywhere. I clearly could use a little more space. In fact, I've cleaned up a little bit. <laughs> but I clearly could use a little more space. And I think it's safe to say I'm probably the only judge that was willing to say give up having their own office. How uh, does this affect your function and her function? Uh, it's a good thing we like each other. But, uh, <laughs> but also, to be honest with you, if I have something that just has to be done, I'm gonna say I'm gonna stay at home and sit at my dining room table because if I need to not be disturbed, it's even though Brooke and I are, as I said, sort of the ones that are supposed to limit that. Um, I'm gonna get stuff done much more effectively sitting at my dining room table without listening to her phone calls. Well, and just all the other things. But actually, it's, I've improved some of my productivity by literally just. It used to be that this door was open and then people would just sort of just come on through. But it, it does, it, there's an impact there, for sure. So, I mean, it, like, so if people do talk to you about, and we're about done with the tour and we'll take you out one, show you the courtroom and then show, let you all go. But um, to talk about a real need, I really think I have a pretty good argument that I need more office space. Sure. <laughs> I don't know what the people are doing. There is actually a safety mechanism hiding in there that way we can tell. I am, where am I? D'Antonio D. What do I look like back then? Cosgrove. Let's see. There I am. For a courtroom. Uh, we, in, in counties in which the population is over 90,000 people, as of 
1998, you have a right to a 12-person jury trial to decide whether or not the gold digger should in, uh, receive the benefits under the will. Um, so we have to have a jury box for that. But as you can see, you can't even put the plaintiff's table and the uh, respondent's table side by side. We have them turned this way because the involuntary psychiatric commitment <coughs> respondent sits in that corner there. And before, when we had the tables turned a different way, uh, one of them tried to attack the lawyer that was trying to have them committed. But now they're, uh, this, is a, this is about as safe as we're going to get. This is also where I perform a lot of weddings. And another use for the jury box is I put every, every, all the folks that want to witness the wedding in the jury box or on this side because I think in theory this is the best background for pictures for the weddings. I think that that's pretty much all I got. So when you can go out there, does anyone have any quick questions? Thank Judge, you. thank you so much. My we'll, pleasure. We're getting ready to start another tour here. We got one more step. We'll bring him back up and see you again. Okay. Um, as as we leave, I just want to let you know we, this is a judicial facility, and what he handles. Although we 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 like to think of courts quite often as the criminal courts, because that's what we see a lot of on TV with uh, murder trials going on or this going on. But really, if you think about it. Um, the civil side of the house is just as dangerous on the security side and for the judge side. Like he discussed, he's committing people that are involuntary commitments that, that are mentally ill. So we're already dealing with some high risk stuff going on there. And then tell me a divorce that has gone through court that you know of that has really gone into a court in front of judge that was civil. <laughs> we call it civil, but how many divorces? So and sometimes with blended families, the will contest is divorce part two. Yeah, and so we have to bring them all in here. How many of y'all know someone has passed away, and you hear families fighting over stuff? Um, and we—that's some of the security issues we deal with. And if you look at the size of this courtroom, trying to even gain control of a situation in a courtroom this size, and the way it's set up is hard. He said there's about a half a dozen people downstairs. So hopefully the next one won't go as fast. We got called two weeks ago in reference to family members fighting, and we have people sitting back here that might not be happy with. You see what I'm saying? So as we go out, that's what I want you to think of is not only how dangerous criminal trials are, where we talk about multiple murders going on, but also how dangerous a civil trial can be when you got two people that are divorced or someone getting committed to a mental you know, institution. But as we walk out, what I really want to point out is we're going to dump out and we have all this going on in here. But as you walk out to the left, that's where our city and attorney is. So now we got all this crazy stuff that might be going on in here. But as you follow me out, yes, the city attorney, the city attorney's office is right in front of our waiting room. There is a well, and I'm sure I'll talk to you soon. Our current mechanical chase that runs from the penthouse all the way down is right here. But you also notice there is no way to get to it. So we have the chase that's on the penthouse. It goes all the way down. And in, and in the basement. But there's, there's some access ports we will show you that will kind of make that point. So if we were to want it to expand the HVAC system or do things like that, we physically would have to tear the building down to get to it. But we'll show you the hatches we have. We're going to go here from the sixth floor down to the fourth, and then we'll show you the hatches on the side and kind of explain that. So like I said, this is your city attorney's office right here. That's correct. That dumps right out. To in the probate court. And y'all will get the opportunity to ride this elevator in a minute. The one you're standing next to? Yeah. Okay. We're going to walk down. Once we, once we get on, we'll ride down. All right, we're going to go down here. Now, ideally, how far down are we going? We're going down two floors. Okay. This is the, four, this is the six, we're going down to the four. Yeah. All right. If you notice as you're going down the stair, we get a complaints of the, the access. The issue here is primarily the door. So imagine if there's a mass actual, uh, evacuation and this door, let me say, like it's like half open and you got people trying to get around that, the, like I said, those are, those are issues it, dealing with evacuations. If we had a mass evacuation, that would be a major concern. Those are the standpipes he was asking about, but. All right, hold on just a second. Let me see. Let me see. I got one more. I'm sorry, guys. Hey, 
if y'all can stop, uh, Dave, right here. All right. Remember I mentioned to y'all that mechanical chase that is available? This is our access to that mechanical chase. Mechanical chase. This is where all the domestic hot water pipes, this is where all the vents, and before they split and go to the to the building, this is where they are. Mm. Yes. So, like I said, that, that's what makes any tiny, any tiny improvements. You can see it's concrete encased all the way in. And this is everything from the 13th floor, I mean 12th floor, all the way down. So we don't have, the, exactly, and so if we needed to come in and replace pipes on whatever floors, you could just imagine the nightmares of trying to get to them because A, you'd have to fight past these pipes, two, there's no type of, you know, maintenance, egress talked about in here at all. So. This is one of the biggest issues for everybody that wants to say, well, let's retrofit this building, let's try to do this. Physically, mechanically, the guts of the building, trying to get to them to make them work. Like I said, you, I mean, this is stories down. There's no supports, there's just supports no. for the pipes. There's no way for us to no get to it. No, nope, that's correct, nothing. If you, if you stuck your head in, you look straight down. <laughs> there's nothing there. And the other, other access is at the very top where we're at the, at the penthouse, where the boiler room runs. That's it. <laughs> Are you talking about access to what again? Uh, anything. You got your domestic water, you got your storm, your sewer, any, all of that, all your pipes, HVAC, any of these wraps. You can't, this is, this is how you would get to them. And you can feel the draft once you kind of stick your head in here, but you can stick in and look right down, and that's, that's it. A few years ago, we had a leak in one of those pipes. We literally had to bring somebody in, and they repelled from the 12th floor down and found the leak. No access into that. Yes. Um, I'm just letting you know I have to leave, so is it okay if I just go down the floor? Let the lieutenant know, yeah, because I don't want them to flip out yeah. and say, hey, people leave. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> he's supposed to be down here to meet me, as a matter of fact. Is there a heliport on the roof? There it is, there it is. Uh, this is the fourth floor. This is, of course, where the sheriff's office is. What we're going to really point out right now is where we store, where we store, where we where we hold the inmates prior to court. Like we've said before, we have normally seven to nine active courts going on at the same time during a regular week. Uh, and so with those active courts, a lot of them are your, your uh, criminal courts that are going on, your superior courts, your state courts, your municipal courts. So with that being said, any arrest that's been made and they take to the county jail, we have to transport those inmates over to this facility and then we have to hold them in jail cells back there. So I'm going to show you those jail cells, um, show you what we're up against, and then I'm going to take you down how we transport the inmates up and down along with how the judges and they use the same elevator. But I'll, let, I'll give you the opportunity to ride in what our elevators we use for transporting inmates on. So if y'all follow me. All right, so like I said, we actively anywhere from 7 to 11 courts running at the same time, okay? Um, this is where we house all of our inmates, and sometimes we have anywhere from 60 to 90 inmates that we have to transport up here. And if you've watched the news at all, you hear of all the, nobody wants to kill, kill one another. Now it's multiple defendants in a murder. They all want to get together and commit this crime. So now we have a lot of multiple defendant trials going on. And then with that, we have keep separates. All right? So that means they all three might be part of the same, but they might be telling on each other, the giving information, so we can't house them together, of course, for obvious reasons. Um, but if you look on a good day, this is our female side, so we'll walk through here, look at what we have. <clears throat> this is where we bring our females majority of the time, or if we have keep separates. Now, if we have females and a couple keep separates, you realize how much of a challenge that can be. All right. <laughs> At the same time, if you look, we don't have cameras back here. We do have an officer that is staged pretty close by that can listen to just in case any medical emergency arises, anything like that that monitors everybody back here. But like I said, if I have a group of females, a couple keep separates, I don't have any room for anybody. And you this said is what I have. Having a 60 to 90 people in this one room at one time? Between this room and the room over there. Okay. 
What do so, you mean by keep separate? Keep separate is if you and I don't get along and we can't be put in the same cell together because we might have committed the crime together, but now I'm telling on you. Or you might be a family member of somebody that I hurt, stole from, murdered. So you and I can't be in the same cell because you might do something to me or I might do something to you. And it's still our responsibility to make sure the health and welfare of every individual that visits our jail and goes through this, this court system is safe and secure and they're able to their rights. So I might not be able to put two individuals in a cell together, three individuals cell, four individuals to cell, um, just like that. How, what do you put them if you run into that scenario? Um, if we run into that scenario, sometimes we keep them off site and have to move them that way, which of course takes manpower. Um, when you start talking about the manpower it takes to hold people at the jail and move all at the same time. And if anybody has spent some time up here and realized when we, especially when we get into jury deliberations, where we, where the jury has to question, so we have to move the inmates out of the courtroom, move them down to holding, and it could take anywhere from five minutes to two hours for these jurors to answer their questions, get their questions out, answer, go back, talk about it, and then if they have another question, they come back up, so we have to move the, the, the inmates back over here, back up, and so it's just a constant juggling act and a manpower issue. So, so ideally, you need more rooms and, and much larger space. Ideally, if yes. yes, ideally we need more holding holding facilities for for what the courts now have become. If you think about it, these were built back when our court flow wasn't seven to eleven courts functioning at one day, um, all of that. So, I was playing, but you're literally in Mayberry right now. Look at it. <laughs> yeah. So if you want to see what our mail holding facility looks like, it's a little bit bigger, but not much. Mm. I opened it and turned it on. No, thank you. <laughs> so if you've got, y'all go ahead and step on in. There, there are days that, that we come back here and this place is, you're lucky if you have a seat. Sometimes they're standing up here. This place is packed full and they're waiting for their name to get called. And this is where we hold them when they go up to all of the courts. Um, <laughs> oh, it all depends. We say a lot of angry men, but sometimes this is their day for justice, their day to be able to. So you have a lot of hopeful people sitting in here, um, but at times it does get angry. And if you think about packing people in here, people are frustrated, angry, ready to go. Or after they get handed down a verdict, and we have to bring them down here and get put in. So it's very volatile in here at all times. Um, you have fights in here, um, but. <laughs> There have been fights in here. I don't want to say it's a daily occurrence. We do our best to, to keep the separates that we have. And like I said, we have a, an officer that sits out there that kind of, his, his ears are tuned for everything going on. Loud voices, if there's, you know, you know when something isn't right, just like your children. You knew the cry, you knew the, the tone of their voice. And that's what that officer's sole job is, to sit back and, and listen for any ruckus. We've had medical emergencies out back here where we have to deal with medical emergencies. Obviously, not all of our, uh, our, our inmates are, are young, healthy males. Sometimes we have older, you know, unhealthy males or females, and so we have to, we have to deal with all of their, their ailments. So, um, we come in through here probably once a week, clean it up, and then, then it goes on. And as you can see, you could tell there's been layers and layers of... Thank you for the information. No, no problem, sir. I think this is a good well, case for why we should get away to see if there is some additional. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Hey Chris, sir. We're getting, I'm getting ready to start shuttling them down. If you don't don't mind just hanging out, All right. uh, we're going to come down this way. And this is what I really what we also want to point out to you. Two way mirror. Yes. Um, that's actually our sergeant's office, but if we have a lot going on, he can open the blinds and see what's going on. Um, 
But what this is, how do we get, you ask, how do we get all these inmates in the building? We get them through one elevator because we can't bring them in to where the public's coming to do record searches or, or go visit the mayor, city manager. So we try to secure them. Plus, we don't want them coming in contact with any of their victims or anything like that. So we bring them through here and <clears throat> this is one elevator. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be able to fit everybody on it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and run you down. Um, if I could get a maintenance guy to come with me. Is there a maintenance guy out there? Yes, sir. If I get one of the deputies to come with me, what I'm going to do is put you in there. We'll take you down, and then we will. Uh, then I'm going to hold you down in the holding area down there. I'm going to go back up and down and, and, and move you all up and down. That's a lot, to say the least. Uh, once you get in the elevator and you realize when I'm transporting or when these, these young men right here are transporting um, multiple individuals, mm -hmm. it gets real tight. And not to, not to mention that this is also the judges that are the elevators the judges use to go to their, their offices. So if y'all would go ahead and step inside, if we could pack it as full as, as we can. Over here too? Yep. Wow. Need to get in the cell. Oh, oh, oh. Alright, I think we got enough. Mike, if I get you to slide far. There you go. You gonna run this yeah. for me? Alright, so keep this in mind. This 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 elevator gets used quite often. Alright, we've had judges get stuck in, in this elevator. We've had inmates and officers get stuck in this elevator and get stuck isn't just hey we're stuck, now you gotta call the elevator crew. So you can be stuck in here for a couple hours. A judge has been stuck in here for a couple hours and officers with inmates have been stuck in a couple hours. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna leave you out here with Corporal Jackson. Um, we've talked before in reference to holes being punched in the building. Before you walk down those stairs, if you look to the right, that's a prime example of how we've just drilled holes in the building to, to run all these wires and stuff. As you can see and you've heard on the news how we've had to punch holes all throughout the building to kind of run all of our wires and everything. If you look right here, this is a prime example where we've drilled into the existing structure and now you can actually look and if you look through this hole you see what's going on above our ground floor. But this is what we've done throughout the building because it wasn't built to, with chases or anything else to run. So. <clears throat> Does anybody have any questions about the fourth floor, how we transport? Um, it's a different experience, wasn't it? Yes. A little different world up there, isn't it? And that's what we do. That's our lives every single day. That's this young man's life every single day. When they bring inmates in, if you think about, like I said, the safety and security, all right, safety and security of the inmates, safety and security of the public, you'll see as we come down these stairs, this is a holding area to get them up to the... And if you think about the challenges we have with the, disabil the, the inmates with disabilities. Not. So as you follow me, a lot of water. Oh, this is daily occurrence. When it rains, it leaks. So if you come on out, as you can see, the mayor parks here, the city manager parks here, all right? And this is where we have to unload inmates at. If you're coming to get a job, we're unloading murderers and people that are on trial for murderers, and you have to come up through here and you'll see a, a van or a car parked here as we're getting inmates out. One that provides serious safety uh, and security risk for the officers, because if I want to come break somebody out, I don't, there, we have no protection, all right? And two, if, uh, if I want to do harm to another inmate, or if one decides to run, where do we have to, to keep them from running, if you think about it? It's wide open. 
If one wants to run, it's wide open. So we have to be on our, our, our <clears throat> top security level conscience and making sure we're blocking all avenues right here. Uh, but this is our sally port. This is how we deliver. And, and while we're doing that, judges are coming in. And like I said, judges and inmates take the same elevator. So keep that in mind. Um, <clears throat> Like I said, there's 70, 60 to 70, 80, 90. Sometimes we might have 10, but this is our only drop-off point. So it's kind of one of those, we do what we do. We, we get out, we protect. If they're walking, we're trying to shuttle them in. A lot of times the van or the car will pull up right here because we try not to give them that opportunity to we get them in and get them up. You see what I'm saying? So if we were communicating every time we had to, we had someone moving in this building, can you imagine what that would do for our job? So does anybody have any questions about that side of the house? Deputies, do y'all want to add anything? And like we talked about before, going back to the maintenance side, if you walk outside, that's our generator. And you see how, how exposed that is. <coughs> well, this concludes your tour. I hope that you have been informed. Um, I hope we've been able to answer all questions that you might have had. Um, and we're just thankful that you took time out of your evening um, to come down and see how we operate. And, and like you've seen, if I get you to step right here. Well, you know, here's my thing. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a public servant. I work with what I'm given. But it's, it's definitely, I'm here to serve you. But I like to open your all's eyes. And if you guys have any recommendations, something that, that we might not, we're open to anything because you look at what we're dealing with. You've been through it. You've had that firsthand experience, the behind the scenes. You know, I've gone to the Georgia Aquarium multiple times, but I took the behind the scenes tour to see what it takes to feed whale sharks, to take care of penguins, and that opened my eyes. So, um, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm here to serve y'all in the best way I can, um, but I like to be protected and safe and secure while I'm doing it. I have I will find out later whether they want me to air the entire tour or not right now. We're just going to have it as a record. So if you wanted to access a copy of the entire tour, you can do that. I will upload it to our YouTube channel, so I can send you a link to that, so you will have access to it. Good. They already started the other? I need one more people to go. Lieutenant Hicks. They're there. Thank you for the information. I'm going to think about everything I saw. It's so enlightening. If I think of